Hello, and welcome to a slightly different response to the audio podcast. Uh, my name's Jonathan Tuckett, and some of you will recognize my voice and now my face uh, from the various RSP Christmas specials. And the rest of you may recognize me from the emails that I send out as the new responses editor. If you get those emails I've kind of mentioned in the past a couple of times now that I'm looking to broaden the framework with which we do responses with and try and come up with new ways to put out uh, content in that respect. Now, uh, doing a video response uh, to the audio podcast isn't necessarily something that we're looking to do on a regular basis, uh, mostly for logistical reasons of backing, going back and forth between the respondent and myself in order to create a nice neat video. Uh, the reason I'm doing this today is more just to continue to test the format in a way that we've already done a couple of times and branch more out into videos so that we can explore this with some of the other ideas that we've got in the pipeline for future events. Um, so yeah, what do I have to say about Sammy's interview with James Spickard on alternative sociology? Well, I'll start off by saying that I'm actually rather relieved. Uh, when I first saw the title of Alternative Sociologies, I was instantly remind, uh, worried, I should say, that James Spickard had fallen prey to the public sociology debate that started in America uh, back in 2005, instigated by the then president of the American Sociological Association, Michael Burovoy. Public sociology and the ensuing public sociology war, as Michael Borovoy calls it, marks an ongoing debate within sociology over its purpose and function. Uh, it's the kind of thing that I actually comment on quite regularly, what academics, or in this case sociologists, think they do compared to what it is that they actually do. Borovoy's war rests on the division of sociology primarily into two different groups. On the one hand, you have professional sociologists, again his phrase, who are guided by the Weberian ideal of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, or as is more commonly framed these days, the idea that sociology should be the pursuit of disinterested research. And on the other side, we have the public sociologists themselves, who think that sociology should engage, shape, and even change the public, for the better of course. Um, although this debate hasn't really filtered into religious studies in terms of the post-public sociology debate, it is kind of identical to the kind of dispute that's taken place between the likes of Donald Weeb and Russell McCutcheon over what it means for a scholar of religion to be critical. Now, back in 2010, the public sociology adherents produced a multi-volume work based on the International Sociological Association's 2008 conference, for which Borovoy was actually the president of the International Association at the time. The title for this multi-volume work comes under the broad heading of Facing an Equal World, Challenges for a Global Sociology. So it's interesting that Sp uh, Spickard comments about how his own book very nearly came under the title of Global Sociology, before the editors forced the title of Alternative Sociologies on him. Ironically, in the case of both, we should actually probably be better off flipping the two titles around. As one of the reviewers of Challenges for a Global Sociology pointed out, what these volumes are really about is the advocation of an ideological sociology under the name of alternative sociology. What this alternative sociology, or indigenous sociology as some of its advocates referred to it in those books, amounts to a critique of the majority of mainstream sociology, which is developed in America and Europe. As they see it, mainstream sociology is a servant to American and European interests in capitalism and imperialism. On this score, many public sociologists tend to have a Marxian bent. Borovoy's initial 11 thesis on public sociology is an homage to Marx in its way. In this respect, the public benefit that the sociologists often speak of is the benefit of a downtrodden proletariat. This makes it rather an anti-establishment uh, project and through guilt by association makes professional sociology, as they call it, pro-establishment. These alternative and indigenous sociologies then are not about complementing existing sociological literature and findings. Rather, they tend to usurp and replace mainstream sociology entirely. As if everything is white, male, heterosexual, uh, inhabitant of the empire does is wrong by default. 
It is an extreme reaction to the conclusions that Vasquez, mentioned by Spicard, draws that the project of secularization has been built into sociology from the very beginning. But actually, think about what it means to label indigenous sociology indigenous. We've already discussed in a few uh, interviews the implications of what the title indigenous religion and indigeneity can mean. But what happens when we start applying that title to a whole methodology of study? What does it mean to do indigenous sociology? Is it sociology done by indigenous folk? Sociology written in the language of those indigenous folk about which it is on? Or is it sociology for the benefit of indigenous folk? Or is it sociology that only applies to those indigenous folk? As noted by a good number of commentators on this issue, these are questions which Bourevoy and his advocates don't necessarily pay attention to when they bandy about the title of indigenous or alternative sociology. Fortunately, when Spickard speaks of alternative sociologies, he does not stumble upon any of these issues. While the way he talks about Ibn Khaldun may come close to some of these questions, his approach is only to highlight the way that we study Ibn Khaldun can problematize and improve pre-existing sociological notions, rather than just replace them out of hand. As he himself recognizes in the interview. People are laying out all of these uh, critiques of standard sociology, and then what they put in their place are really not very good understandings of symbolic interactionism, not even going to Mead's philosophy of the act, where there really is some good stuff. In this regard, despite what his publishers might have felt, Spicard's work is perhaps more deserving of the title global sociology than that produced by Bourevoy's public sociology. It is a sociology, as Spicard describes it, which is world conscious. A decentered sociology which recognizes that those who happen to be born at the center of the empire are not thereby at the center of the world. But the crucial question to be asked here is just how world conscious Spickard actually is. Or, to put it another way, can we be even more world conscious than what he's recommending right now? What I mean by this is that in Spickard's own words, there was a problem with the 1990s sociology in that it didn't know how to approach the question of religious experience. In trying to understand the Japanese case, they didn't necessarily have the concepts to deal with the way in which people were responding to their questions. But what does the introduction of the phrase religious experience mean in this case? On a practical level, how do we introduce such a notion without becoming the neo-colonialist imperialists that the public sociologists think that we are? It's not easy moment of shameless self-promotion here, I have an article coming out shortly in which I take Spickard to task on what he actually means by religious experience. So I'll highlight another example instead, the sacred. In highlighting the Confucian case, Spickard highlights how the sacred inheres in relationships. But what does it mean to describe these relationships as sacred? Does he mean the virtue which he speaks of a moment later? Not necessarily, because in building his discussion towards Ibn Khaldun and the idea of El Sabir, we get this idea of the sacred, or better yet, sacredness, premised purely upon social relationships. Relationships are the key, we are told. But far from being alternative, this seems to me like a notion of the sacred which is rather old in sociology. It all sounds very Durkheimian. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Durkheim's notion of the sacred per se. I mean, if we had gone down the Iliadan route, then the public sociologists would be completely justified in calling us neo-colonial imperialists. But what I'm asking is, is even this Durkheimian application in this particular case all that useful for a world-conscious sociology? Yes, relationships are key. As a phenomenologist, I agree wholeheartedly with that claim. I am convinced of the fundamental importance of intersubjectivity at all its various levels for when we engage with the topic of religion. But what I think we should ask, and what I think a world conscious sociology should ask, is whether if religion is about relationships, do these necessarily need to be sacred relationships? What is it, as Spickard warns of the 1990s sociology, that we might be missing if we only look for sacred relationships. So while I'm a great advocate of this idea of a world-conscious sociology which pays attention to the fact that we, 
are not the center of the world. I also think at the same time, it has the potential to go much further. That's where I'll finish this response with this idea that perhaps we can go a little bit further.